Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Chapter 11. I don't know, maybe I'm coming down with something, but I feel like I hear my head in my head. Is this a microphone thing? Okay, cool. I warned you guys. Verse 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. Now, if you're new to this series, if you're new to the chapel, it's been a very exciting book, Ecclesiastes, because we have this man, Solomon, the son of David, the guy who killed the giant. And Solomon went through this experiment to figure out life. He wanted to find out what gives life meaning. And all that we really gather from Solomon is that everything is vanity, everything is meaningless, and he goes on this roller coaster where basically he says, I'm just going to party like crazy. And then he switches gears and says, everyone's going to die. And then he switches gears and said, let's go eat some food. And then he switches gears and said, everyone's going to die. And that's Ecclesiastes. And it just goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And now in the end, he's giving us this wisdom. And and he's going to give us some snippets. So we're not going to have to explain a lot today because some of this is pretty self-explanatory. When he says, cast your bread upon the waters, he's saying, what you have, what you have earned, share with people because you don't know what disaster is going to come. Share with people what you have. And he even gives us a little principle. He says, share it with seven, no, maybe even eight people. And I think of anybody in the world, followers of Jesus ought to be the most generous people. But often, we are the most stingy, chintzy people. I remember when I was a server in Hawaii, I worked at a restaurant, and there was this missions group that was near us. I'm not going to name them because I love them, but the people they discipled tipped terribly. Because they would come in to this restaurant where I was like the best server that had ever existed. It was at Bubba Gump Shrimp Company. Picture it now, okay? Visor upside down. It was in Hawaii, so I was tan. It was awesome. And they would come in, and they would bring in like 30,000 people. 13, probably. And they would say, we'd like one mud pie and 17 waters. And these kids would drink water after water after water. And then at the very end of it all, they would tip me. And they'd be like, the mud pie was $7, so let's give them like uh, 50 cents or a dollar. My Christians are the worst, which shouldn't be the case. We should out-tip everyone because we've been out-tipped in Jesus. We've been given more than anyone's ever been given. We should be the highest tippers. When we go into our hair salon, when we go into our restaurants, the the server should be fighting for us. The hairstylist should be like, I want them because I know they're going to kick me down with some money. This is what Solomon's telling us. Cast your bread upon the waters because guess what? Tomorrow, once again, Solomon brings us to the point, you might die. Disaster might come. The stock market may crash. The housing market may fail. So be generous because generosity gives you something that can't be taken away. When you're generous toward others, they can't take away that sense of joy, that sense of giving the gift that God instills and has wired into us. We're going to keep moving because I want to get to the aging part because I think it's hilarious. Verse 3, if the clouds are full of rain... They empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. This is Solomon just saying, look guys, life is going to happen. Don't let the scary things in life push back your decisions. Don't let the fact that it's going to rain one day push back your productivity. Solomon knows that life can be difficult. Anyone in here that's, that's lived some life, you know that there's some mornings when you do not want to get up to work. There's some mornings when the inbox count on your email looks catastrophic. There's some mornings when you no longer know how to parent your teenager because all of a sudden, sometime between 14 and 17, they became what their minds think of as Wikipedia, and we know it just as stupidity. But you just don't know how to handle it, and you can get to your wit's end. And Solomon says, look, don't put off making the hard decisions just because life is going on. Because the trees are going to fall, it's going to happen. Rain's going to come, it's going to happen. There's going to be good and bad, but keep on sowing. Keep on plugging forward. Keep on doing what God has called you to do. And that's a very unique thing. God calls all of us to be generous. God calls all of us to make disciples of other people, to share the good news of what Jesus has done in our life with other people. But then beyond that, God calls some of you to be salespeople, some of you to be teachers. Some of you to be restaurant workers, some of you to to mow lawns, some of you to do whatever the hundred things are, but do those things for God without fretting what's going on around us. Don't let the fear of our culture today paralyze you. Don't let the fear of the political climate paralyze you. Because if I've learned anything, Hillary and Donald are just human beings. 
And God is still God. It doesn't matter which reforms you think will work. It doesn't matter which walls you like or don't like. It doesn't matter which tax plans. Because God is still in control. If, if we think that those people have some massive amount of authority, the Bible would tell us that it's only given to them by God himself for his purpose and his glory, which is terrifying in one hand, but then it's comforting knowing that in the instant of a blink of an eye, God could wipe them out and we'd all have to vote for someone else. I mean, allegedly, I've heard this is what people pray for. Okay. I'm not condoning. See, now I sound like Trump, like a, never mind. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Verse 5, as you do not know the way the Spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a child, in the, in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. God is the miracle giver. I, I think it's fantastic that we have ultrasounds. I love, loved that first ultrasound. Can all of you moms and dads remember the first time you saw your kid inside of the womb? What a surreal feeling that was. And like every dad in the room wanted his kid to be doing something cool. Like, oh, look what he's doing with his hand. Yeah, he looks like a football player. No, not really. He looks like a gummy bear. You know? And it's incredible that we've come so far, yet we still have no idea. Like, how does the soul fuse to the, the baby in the womb? When does that life, like, how does God do that? Is it like in the act, like after Barry Manilow gets turned down and the boom, you know, the collision, the egg thing, boom, and then the soul, and then they come out like a transformer that mothers have to literally feed for nine months. I mean, this whole miracle process, God says, look, or Solomon's telling us, look, you don't even know how birth works. You, you don't even know when the soul comes in. Leave things in God's hands. Don't try to pick up and manage everything. We have to trust God at some point. God has miracles going on moment after moment, day after day, that we cannot explain. And I think sometimes in our culture, we love to be able to manage everything. So we, we relegate miracles to calendars. And, and when someone makes a decision to follow Jesus, we say, well, that, that was the decision they made. Or the sovereign God of the universe plummeted down from heaven, sent Jesus, Jesus rose again, sent his spirit, and now his spirit is roaming the earth, working in people's lives, twisting and turning. I, I've shared this once before. I got in an argument once about how sovereign God is because I am one of these guys that believes that God is totally sovereign and simultaneously we are not robots. We are not automatons, but God is in control of everything. And the person across from me in the argument was so flustered that I would say that God is in control of every piece of dust flying through every moment of space, of every animal on the earth, that he stood up and he said, are you telling me that God would cause a line of ants to walk across this room and he's doing it, it's not up to the ants. And I said, yes, because if those ants got in my way and I saw them and paused for one second, it may have made me one second late to my next meeting, which made me five minutes late to my next meeting, which made me meet somebody that needed Jesus. And God used the ants. Now, we don't always look at life that way, but God uses every little moment in your life. I think every time you stub your toe, God's just making you slow down and work on your swearing. I think, I, I do. I think every time I get stuck in the car line at, at school, dropping off my kids, it's not an excuse for me to blow a gasket that people don't know how to drive in Florida. It's a reason for me to pray for every child that I'm seeing walking into their school, saying, God, keep these children safe. God, teach these kids to know your son, Jesus. God, surround Jackson with people that don't know Jesus so that he can tell them the good news of Jesus. I, we, we have these choices, these moments and the ripple effects that go out, we, we will never know the extent. I don't think we'll ever know the extent of the ripples that go out from our lives and how they changed everyone around us, whether it's traffic, a stubbed toe, or a school car line. God makes everything and keeps everything in his timing. Verse 6, In the morning sow your seed, and at evening withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. God's saying, work hard. Work from morning to night. T take your chances. Try things out. Verse 7, light is sweet, and it is pleasant for eyes to see the sun. So, so here we go. We're switching into the part about aging well. So if, you're, if, you, if you look at me and you think you're older than me, I'll just give you the, the number. If you're older than 35, 35 and up, I'll say, so that I can put this on myself, we, we're older, right? We're no longer spring chickens, we're what they call summer hens or winter fowl or whatever you want to call yourself. If you're younger, then you're still invincible. 
You still don't know where you're going with your life. All of life looks like a confusing map, okay? So now Solomon's going to bounce back and forth. How to be young well, how to age well. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in all of them. But let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. So first off, aging, awesome. Age well. If you're here and you're thinking like, okay, I want to age well for Jesus, Solomon starts very simple. If you live a long time, rejoice. He does not say, if you live a long time, it gives you the right to be a cantankerous, grumpy human being. He does not say that. He says, rejoice. If you get to be 60, rejoice. If you get to be 70, rejoice. If you get to be 80, rejoice. If I get to be 90, I'm going to kind of, I don't know. 90 is a long time. Rejoice, Solomon tells us. But remember that days of darkness will be many. Anyone here had a dark day? Yeah. Some days have, I felt like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. Some years I felt like Eeyore. You wake up and the cloud is already there. Before I did anything wrong, before I sinned or not sinned, before I prayed or not prayed, I've woken up in the cloud. And it follows us sometimes in seasons of life. He goes on to say, young, young people, are you listening? Young people under 35, raise your hand, under 35. Okay, listen up, under 35, it's going to get dangerous. Rejoice, O young man or woman, in your youth. Rejoice in your youth. Let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. Okay, stop. Young people, be happy where you are. That's what he's saying, plain and simple. And then he says something that's crazy to me because I'm a parent now. When I was a youth pastor or a 20-year-old, this wasn't crazy. Now that I'm a parent, this is ludicrous speed. Well, what he says is, young people, rejoice where you are and do what you want. It, he, says, he says, walk in the ways of your heart. Whatever your heart wants, go for it. Now, this is not the advice I'm giving to my children, at least one of them. So, so Silas is prone to hurt things, right? We went to Disney Springs on Wednesday for my wife's birthday, and there was a juggler juggling bowling pins. And first he throws one to Jackson, and Jackson catches it. He's so excited because he's the first. And the juggler says, throw it back like this. So Jackson goes, woo, and the juggler catches it and keeps going, mm, 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 mm. And then he throws one to Savannah. So I'm like, uh-oh, you know. Savannah catches it, and she doesn't care. She doesn't want to play games. She's like the king of the world, so she just throws it on the ground. So he picks it up. Now, here's where the juggler went wrong. He gave one to Silas. So he's going, okay, you little man, you're in the family, right? Boom, throws one to Silas. Okay, big man, throw it back to me. Now, Silas has it like this, and I think he's going to go like this, but he doesn't. He goes like this, and he throws it, and the pin goes right by the guy's head. He had to duck. The pin went about 40 feet past the guy, and I'm like, there's my children. So when I drop off Silas to school in the morning, I say, buddy, don't hurt anybody. Love Jesus and be kind. Because that's not his natural disposition. I want to steer him. When I drop off Jackson, who is mostly timid, I tell him crazy things. And parents hear me and they think, I'm crazy. Because I'll say, Jackson, do something bold. Take a risk and do something dangerous, like hurt something. And, okay, Daddy. And he'll come home. I'll be like, son, did you do your mission? I almost hurt something. <laughs> We're working on him still. Young people, do, be happy where you are and and follow your heart, but know, Solomon says, that God will bring you into judgment for it. So don't act like a fool, but, but if your heart right now, if you're in your 20s, you're invincible, don't, don't just say, well, when I'm 50, I'm going to do this. When I'm 40, I'm going to do this. Maybe God's calling you to go on a mission trip. Maybe God's calling you to be a missionary. Maybe he's calling you to be a missionary here in Fishhawk. Maybe a missionary in Kenya. Maybe a missionary in India. Maybe God's calling you to start a company. Maybe God's calling you to do great things. Bible and Solomon would say, go. Don't wait for something else to fulfill you, to satisfy you. I meet a lot, a lot of people in their 20s especially that are waiting for something to make their life whole. They're saying, you know, when I get married, then life will be better. When I have kids, then life will be better. After I have kids, when they get out of the house, my life will be better. And it's always like the, the best chapter is the one that's just out of reach. And then all of a sudden, we've gone from 20 to 30 to 40, and we're still reaching for that next thing not realizing that the pattern is the same. Solomon says, when you're young, go for it. So young people, go for it. Be a thorn in your parents' side in Jesus' name. Do crazy things for God. 
Don't let the word no hold you back from doing glorious things because you'll never know what God can do through a teenager or a 20-some-year-old. Good luck, parents. Verse 10. This one's tough. Remove vexation, young people, from your heart. It's a word we don't use very often. And put pain away from your body, for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. So here we go. Solomon's like, go for it, young people. Young people, life's going to be terrible. So he goes, young people, remove vexation from your heart. Now here's free wisdom. If you are still in the mode of young people, or if you still remember what being young tasted like, I, this is a, I'm pleading with you. Deal with your heart issues when you're young because it only gets harder when you get older. So, so let me break this down practically. If you have an anger issue in your teens and 20s that you don't begin to bring to God and say, God, why am I angry? What's driving me to be angry? Why do I desire control so much? If you don't deal with that in your youth, it doesn't get easier when you get older. It doesn't get simpler as life goes on because an angry teenager and 20-something-year-old becomes an angry married person. And when you take an angry married person, you're, you're taking one sinner and you're adding another pot of sin. And then you have kids, so you're adding three kettles of sin around an angry person. Do you think that that makes an angry person more soothed and relaxed? Do you think what an angry person needs are three miniature human beings that have no concept of public decency? That scream and pull at you? My wife and I have had my mother-in-law in town for just a few days, and it's been surreal, like life-changing, positive, good news. We go on uh, car rides when my mother-in-law's here without children, and it is the weirdest thing. Because usually in car rides, our conversations go like this. Hey, babe, do you want to go? Be quiet! No, 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 no. Be quiet! Uh, pow, 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 pow! My wife and I went on a date the other night, and we were just talking, and it was so quiet. I was like, hey, babe. She was like, Hello, hello, hello. Because it was so quiet. It, and I, I just started to remember, like, okay, kids can make me crazy. I'm, I'm glad that I removed some vexation from my heart. Now, let's talk real deep, because we've talked about marriage. The sermon that I preached about marriage a few weeks back, that thing's been kicking my butt ever since. And one of the things I, I thought about here, young people, if you don't deal with your sin issues in regards to sexuality in our culture, those are going to turn into plants of destruction down the way. If you don't get under control the way, that you, the way that you lust, the way that you look at things longer than you should. We had an incredible uh, men's group uh, yesterday. It was a smaller gathering, but man, at the end of that group, I felt so refreshed and freed that all of the guys in that circle were as dumb and broken as me. I was like, well, this is really good, guys. And no joke, this is free advertisement for Band of Brothers. At the end of it, we had somebody say, word for word, I guess since it's my turn, I'm just going to go ahead and join the lust party. Now, if you weren't there, it doesn't make sense. But if you're a man, you know that it makes sense. Now, if you don't deal with that issue in your teens and 20s, it becomes something worse down the road. It doesn't, it's not a snowball that, that loses steam. It's a snowball that's picking up steam. And, and the seed of lust and the seed of, of sexual addiction, the pursuit of pleasure, it's going to snowball into something that destroys marriages. It's going to snowball into something that passes on sin because kids are going to see moms or dads with this thing, and they're going to say, this is okay to do, so I'm going to do it. Young people, deal with your heart issues in your youth when it's, it's still hard, but it's not going to crush your soul hard. It's hard to deal with the sin things in life, to bring the Bible to bear on the areas where you know you're out of alignment with God's will, but it's worth it now before those things dig their claws into your soul and make it very difficult to release later. Here's the next one. Put away vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body. I, I bashed on kale a few weeks ago. I got so many kale recipes in my inbox and on my Facebook. It was crazy. Um, so, so here's what he's saying. Put away pain from your body. Now, if you're young here, see, here's what Solomon's doing. He's talking to young people. Young people don't know what this means. So young people, for illustration, one day, I promise you, you will tie your shoe and wonder why your back is saying don't get up. Young people, one day, I promise you, you will turn to empty the dishwasher and your back will say that is not an appropriate angle for you. And you will be stuck there. One day you will pick up your kid and realize that if you pick up your kid, he's acting as a pulley system for a hernia the other way. 
one day because our bodies begin to fail. Solomon says, take care of your body. So here's what I'm doing, you guys, this week. And I, I told Matt, our drummer today, that I was doing this. So I'm starting P90X tomorrow. P90X is like a code word for I'm torturing myself for 90 days. And I need accountability because I'm terrible at it. Because I'm terrible at like wanting to, I, if I didn't tell you, I could say, oh, yeah, yeah, I just I decided not to do it. But now I'm telling all of you here, like 150, 160 people, that me and Matt DeLeonardi, the guy right there, we're doing P90X for 90 days because Solomon says, while you can still do it, do something. Take care of your body. So I'm going to be chowing down kale, that dirty, nasty lettuce. I'm going to be eating oats and exercising all over my floor. Please pray for us. Okay. This is Solomon telling us to do this. Take care of your body while well, it's still an option. Now, because here's, he's going to switch gears now and talk about the people for whom it's not an option. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain, Solomon says, death is coming for us all. So while you can run, get your Fitbit and run. While you can eat, but while you have your teeth, <laughs> use them. It's so good. And he says this in here. This is not me. If you get mad at me, Solomon's about to say the same thing that I just said, but in the Bible language, so you get mad at him, okay? Right here. In the days, verse 3, the keepers of the house tremble. So the keepers of the house are your legs, the things that keep your house moving. In the days, they tremble, and the strong men are bent. The things you lift to, to work out, the things you use to battle, the strong men are your shoulders. So when your legs get weaker and your shoulders are bending in, and here it is, and the grinders, the grinders cease because they are few. So, so don't get mad. I don't want that email. You send that email to Solomon circa dove, okay? Solomon says, one day your legs will get weaker. One day your shoulders will bend down. One day your grinders will be, now obviously it's a different culture because they didn't have dentures. We have that. So it's, it's deceptive. I already have a fake tooth and I'm only 35. One day, these things are coming for us. And one day, those who look through the, wind, uh, through the windows are dimmed and the doors of the, on the street are shut. When the sound of the grinding is low, you can't even chew anymore. And one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low. He's saying one day our bodies are slowly going to get to that point. Now, he wants us to, to age well. He wants us to age in a way that points people toward God, not pointing people toward how sad or how angry we are. I, trust me, just at 35, I know that it is easy to get angry that my body doesn't know what my mind knows anymore. My mind knows that I can jump a certain height. My body says, no. Just this morning, I tried to hit my head on the fishing net that's in the children's hall, and I thought, surely I could do this. Because I, I used to hit my head on nine-foot-high ceilings. My mind said yes. My body said no. It, it wasn't working out. Some of you know those pains already. Some of you understand what it means when the keepers of your house can no longer hold it up and are trembling. Some of you know what it means when we talk about the strong men, the shoulders no longer being able to lift. I'm, I'm right on the other side of that cusp. So now if something needs to be lifted at the chapel, I, I'm at the point where I look around for someone in their 20s. I didn't do that until recently because I've realized that if I lift something, my back says no. My arms say not today. So I, I look around and say, where's Jesse and Corey? There's a big young person here somewhere. Don't look at me. Remember, before you can't hear the sound of your grinders, Here's what also happens when we get old. They are afraid also of what is high, and terrors are in the way. Now, this is just something weird. Um, have you guys seen that video going around right now about the glass bridge in China? Hilarious. Now, I used to skateboard, um, and I loved it. I, I was sponsored by a company. I got free boards. It was really cool. And I would, like, go down a 10-stair. So I'd, 
an ollie. So if you don't know what ollie is, it's, it's like where you kick the tail down, you slide the front up, and the board goes with you in the air. So I'm trying to do this for those of you who don't know how to skateboard. And I'd fly down 10 stairs and then land. And sometimes the board would flip and do little things in between. I look at 10 stairs now, and I'm thinking, where's the rail? I, I go on ropes courses when I'm a teenager. No fear in the world. When I was a youth pastor, I, I thought I could do anything. I would climb up to the highest tree. I'd jump off. Someone's going to catch me. The last pastor's retreat I went on with my wife, they had a high ropes course. My wife was egging me on. Just come to the high one. Come to the top. I'm like, I ain't coming to the top. Come on, you're not going to die. I'm like, I'm not worried about dying. I'm worried about being maimed and not dying. Look, they got the rope. That guy got the rope? That guy's five foot eight, nothing, 100 pounds, nothing. I'm 222 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal. How's that guy going to hold me up? So I didn't go. Because age had grasped me. And I was saying, high place, not good. If it's above my head, it's too high. My head's six foot six. If it's higher than that, I don't need that in my life. I'm a positive thinker. Solomon says that this is what's going to happen. Then he go, goes on. He says, when you get old, the almond tree blossoms. Almond trees have these beautiful white blossoms. He's talking about hair. I just noticed that I've already got gray beard. I can't grow a beard yet because I'm half Filipino. And the beard that I do have is turning gray faster than it's growing in. And my gray is creeping up. I've been finding gray arm hairs. I'm waiting. I know the day is coming. And Solomon didn't write about it, but the day is coming when hair starts sprouting, right? It moves. It leaves my head, and it comes out everywhere. Nose, ears, back. It just comes. It's coming for us. Solomon tells us, when you get old, high up things, they're going to they're scare you. Not like when you were young. Your hair is going to go gray. This is, this is really hard. The grasshopper drags itself along. You just picture a grasshopper just like in the Florida humidity. Uh, uh, I cannot jump. Uh. That's what happens when you get older. This is the Bible. Don't email me. And then this one is crazy to me. And desire fails. He's talking about sexual desire. So that is the age for me where I want to go be with Jesus. Okay? So if I'm going gray hair, I'm good. My legs are shaky, I'm good. I can use walkers, canes, glasses, hearing aids, dentures, I'm good. I can't jump, I'm still good. But the day that I wake up and I'm like, oh, I just don't feel like sex, I think that day I'm going to say, not good. And I don't know, because I'm young, right? I don't know. But, but maybe by then I'll, nope, I'm pretty sure I'm not good. Okay. <laughs> Desire fails. Why? Why does all this stuff happen? Because man is going to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. All of these things happen, and it's paving the way to show you that you are about to meet your maker. Every gray hair is a lesson that God has sent us as a gift to say, you're coming home. Every time you've got to get your prescription glasses refilled, it's a parable that God is trying to call out to you and say, you're coming home. You're coming home. Your, your eyes that are bad, just wait. Because when you die, if you could bring glasses to heaven, the first thing you do would be to take them off. You, you, think, that, you think that your legs are getting bad? It's just a few more steps. And then you're going to jump like you did again when you're in your teens. You, you think you can't hear? I mean, I'm, I'm sure, I'm 100% sure that couples who know Jesus and love Jesus and are going to be in heaven together in the kingdom of God, I know that there's going to be so many wives in line just to tell their husbands how deaf they were. I told you you needed a hearing aid. Uh, husband's going to be like, I did. I never knew. Because we're like that as men. We pretend like we don't need anything until we're blind and deaf, bumping off of walls and human beings in Target, right? But, but God's going to use every one of those parables to point us to him, to let us know that you are going to find an end soon. Man, Verse 6, before the silver cord, this is life, is snapped, and the golden bro bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All this life is vanity. I like how he goes from birth to death in just this short section. He wants us to know that there's a miracle that God breathes life into a baby. And at the end of our life, there's this vanity 
that that breath that God breathed into us is breathed out. It, and the interesting thing is, when we breathe out our last breath, that's it. I mean, our technology can only resuscitate us so far, can only carry us so far, but our, our bodies, if we exhale and don't inhale again, begin to become the dirt, the dust from which we came. Now, if, if we don't let this sober our minds up, then we'll make life, like Solomon did, all about the moment here, the 78 to 90 years of life that we have here. And Solomon, as we close out Ecclesiastes next week, puts the bookend on all of it that said, that's not the point. Your life here alone is not the point. There's a greater point. Whether, whether or not you find yourself in, in God's camp or you're searching or you're questioning, the point is, is that there's a God who created you. And we are to live in relationship with him. And there's these things that will ail you and your body as you age. But God, in his infinite wisdom, said, I've got this plan set out. I'm going to make gray hair sprout so people know that the, the finish line is coming. I'm going to make eyes grow dim. I'm going to make legs grow weak. And every one of those moments is a sign for us to begin depending on God more. To know that though our body is dying, Jesus died in his body and was punished for our sins so that ultimately we get resurrection bodies like his. If you didn't know that, if you're unfamiliar with that doctrine, Jesus died, was put in the tomb, Three days later, he rose again, and he had a new body. The only thing he had in his body that we know of are the holes where he was pierced. The holes. We get bodies like Jesus, who ate breakfast. Thank God we get to eat breakfast in heaven. I love breakfast. I love bacon. I'm sure bacon is all over heaven. Jesus could walk through walls. All of my sci-fi dreams are coming true in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus could talk and hug and embrace. Jesus could have a cup of coffee. Jesus could share stories. Now, what Solomon wants us to know is that as we age, if we don't work out the vexation in our heart, if we don't take the issues of our life and hand them over to God, then we're going to find ourselves in a very difficult situation later on. This is what we have charged to us today. Age well. Young people, be on fire for God. Live for Jesus and do crazy things that make your parents look away, just like Ali Raceman's at the Olympics. No Olympic watchers here. Older people, finish strong. Let every creaking joint, let every popping knee remind you that Jesus is coming to take you home. And let that compel you to live well at the finish line. Well, we're going to pray. And I'm going to invite up Bree and Edwin. Not Edwin. Yes, Edwin. To take our offering. And, and as we hear this song, I think it's so funny that this song was chosen in advance. The song is called If We're Honest. And I think too many of us are being dishonest with where we are, with God or with others. And my hope as a chapel family is that we would be brutally honest with ourselves so that we can have at least a little bit of honesty with each other re regarding where we are with Jesus, how much we're depending on him or how much we're depending on ourselves. Because you can depend on yourself when you're young, but one day the grinders will grow few and the legs will tremble and the shoulders will bend over. So let's pray. God, I thank you for you.